So the other thing is uh, the format, right? So it's easy to get out in front of people and do something like slide, 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 right? How much of you love, why do you like slide presentations? So basically yeah, a, a presentation will you, um, help you to guide you through on the major uh, steps of your speech. That's, um, that should be useful. So is it, is it, did you just mean to say, I like slides because it's a structured step through a process or an experience? And to make sure that I don't miss a thing that I want so to So later you can get the slides and you can read them and check. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> I think it also depends on the type of presentation it is. Right. Some presentations can be done only on slides. And, and the way I like to do it is I have no text in my slides, just images. Yep. Some, I'm, I, I, that presentation Zen style of like pictures and waterfalls. And yeah, I, I make snippets of pictures that I create in MS Word. Point, blah 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 and I have images in my slides yep. I think it's easy for me to reiterate my thoughts but then activities case studies presentation blah blah everything on the screen is also important but I think that depends on the type of presentation the type of idea that you're sharing with the audience good good Gabor, Gabor's got a question build the content around the con uh, hello Gabor go for it yeah, so I just came back from Japan and in Japan you have to use pretty much slides and you have to use as, ma as much text as possible so almost like there are slides that I've seen that had like 10, uh, just 10 lines of you know, text in Japanese and no picture at all. And every single slide was like that. So it's also a cultural thing, but uh, we can relate better to pictures. But in Japan, like they asked me to put more text on my slides. Well, let's just be clear. That's not what we want. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Um, Another thing to remember is never use transitions in slides. They just get in the way when you decide you don't want to use that one. <laughs> you think that's funny, but I actually put this slide in specifically for that point. Um, okay, so there's these different methods, right? So presentations, case studies, discussions, games, activities, workshops, and explorations, right? So going from left to right, going from left to right, um, it's kind of more immersive, more experiential, and it's going to deliver a richer learning experience on the left than it is on the right, generally. However, you're right, some topics are best delivered through slides, and some topics are best delivered through interaction and games and stuff like that. So be mindful of what you're trying to do and choose the best format. Usually when we take submissions for the conference, like 80% of people want to do a presentation with slide decks. Makes me sad, <laughs> right? Um, because we know that that is better than that. And we also know spending two days sitting in front of slides and case studies and whatever, just people just their brains fill up and they just can't you ask them what they saw during the day and they can't remember, right? So, you know, if we mix up the style of delivery, then they can have different experiences and it's much easier for them to kind of process it and, you know, retain it, right? And you're much more likely to retain it if you use it I can't remember, I bet one of the smart people in the room, I'm looking at you, Chan, um, knows the academic stuff behind like how long it takes for you to forget things. Like is it 50% of stuff gets forgotten if you don't use it in four hours or some random number like that? You know, there's real, the real numbers? Yeah, something like that. And if you don't repeat it within, uh, I think, it's, uh, a few times in, in the one week, you'll forget it as well. Yeah. So you have to repeat you, it so afterwards. you really got to be hands on and you really got to like then have homework to go and do within the next few days. And so when you're designing content for people, give them jobs to do and get them to follow up and do it the next day or do it at home, right? And if you're doing it, if you're doing a session and it's actually better than everyone else's, you should get them to come back to your same session the second day and then you know, get them to repeat the thing so they can really figure it out. Uh, I like case studies. Case studies are really good, but only when they're done right. Now, uh, several of you have done case studies. Chris just walked out, he's done plenty of them. You've done a few. A few of you other guys have done case studies as presentations as well, right? Telling the story is okay, but you can make it so much better, right? So, uh, have you guys heard of the Harvard, Harvard Business School's case study style? Yeah, right? So, the way I interpret it, and we're all, yeah, we, we interpret things. The way I interpret it is, you set up the story, right? So you, you tell the story of like, there was this thing and there were these people and yeah, you know, amongst the people there was Susan, there was Craig, there was Rumor, right? And Susan's agenda was this and Craig was trying to do that and Rumor was trying to do this. And through telling those stories, you see the conflict emerge, right? And you set up the situation. And then you go, right, I told you, I told you the setup, 
Now you're all smart people. You're not novices. You know what's going on, right? You know the theory, right? You know, fast feedback loops, visualize the work, level out the power relationships, all that sort of stuff. You all know that, right? So now I've set up the thing. Break up into groups of four or five and have a conversation and use your knowledge of theory to say what should happen next, right? And then rather than the presenter just presenting, all of a sudden the room is just spending five minutes or so talking amongst themselves, using their brain, trying to solve a puzzle, and they're doing it with a couple of other people, right? And then you can step back from that, you can, they can all talk, and then sip your beer. And then you can say, room, what did you come up with, right? And they say their thing, and you say their thing, and they say their thing, you know how that goes, right? And then everyone like also gets the chance to ex, you know express the things and you know and so it's again it's another loop in learning, and the groups are listening to each other and they're kind of listening to say did they come up with the same result as us? If somebody came up with something radically different, then someone in that group is going oh, yeah. right. So you get all this extra thinking going on by taking this approach. Only then do you go right. That's really interesting. Thank you very much for your contribution. Now I'll tell you what really happened. Right. And now I'll tie it back to what organizational theory or behavioral psychology or whatever topic it is says should have happened, right? So then you can close out with a reconciliation of like, so you thought that, this is what really happened. And because I'm the expert in the room, my statement about what the relevant theory is is most you know, authoritative. Um, and then, you know, what do we learn from that as a group plus, right? So that's, that's a really, really strong power. Have you done it that way? I know, I'm just taking notes so I should be doing it. <laughs> right. So I think, I think it was Eduardo in No Fuentes. Um, he, two years ago, he came to the last conference and uh, he was like, I'm going to do a case study. I'm like, Eduardo, don't do it. He's like, what do you mean? And I told him like my frustration with case studies. They could be so much better. And he went, oh. And I told him this. And he went, I'll try it out. And he did it. And he came up immediately after he hunted me, found me in amongst those thousand people at the conference. He's like, Craig. Cray, that was amazing, <laughs> right? Because he didn't have people sitting there passively listening. He had them actively engaged. And at the end of it, like, a bunch of them are like, oh, and, 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 you know, and they're telling him what they would have done and what their thoughts are. And at their workplace, they've got the same situation. They can connect the dots now. And so it was so much more powerful. So if you're doing case studies, think about that approach. <sighs> so because I'm unable to read what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to your ideas, the, the right? Present. So if you can connect back to the buddy that you were with before, right? I want you to think about like whatever you've got there is related to something that you've experienced in the past. And I want one of you to take a case study approach and try to follow that arc, right? So this is just a simplified version of it, right? So just take five minutes. One of you is gonna talk through it to the other. And what I want you to do is just experience it with each other. Right? I'm sure many of you didn't finish that activity, but what did you, what did you think about the uh, approach? What was your experience? I was actually thinking that the idea that I want to talk about can, on, can only be done through a presentation. But when I was going through those questions and answering them in context, like taking my topic as context, I can actually represent it as a case study and that sounded much more interesting. Oh, good. Yeah. Excellent. Anyone else got a uh, reflection or an outcome? Um, in terms of which topics to turn into case studies, um, looking at mine, because my dilemma is which one to do out of a bunch, um, the key thing is that it's a common enough experience that people would actually be able to contribute. Right. Because they have to have access to some context. thinking framework yeah. to solve the puzzle then. Yeah. Yeah, Sue. So. And um, no, what I learned was um, when we are presenting or we're thinking about presenting, everyone has a different way of approaching something. Yeah. So I actually learned something different from Anne. I've gone, oh, actually, that's quite useful, you know? Cool. Um, so that, that was quite good. But also, just, yeah, I think it's bearing in mind the audience thinks differently to you. Yeah. Just driving that home for me. That's really good. Audiences are different. Yes. They don't think like. Okay. So, cool. so from, from Sue, we actually, Sue's, it was Sue's story. And what I learned from it was if you present to me the story with the solution up front, then I'm already bored. So it was more helpful when Sue unpacked her story for the beginning, the drama, the unsolved conflict, then I was interested. 
then how did you solve this problem? So that's what I learned. That's what it's there to do, right? Okay, I have a question. And the question is, should we teach something during each session? Or because my idea was, I shared it with Paul, that we might have a good session about just sharing our problems with each other. We don't trying to solve it based on the textbook because, because when we go to the sessions, people say, okay, you can do this, you can do a retro like that. But most of the Scrum Master's iterations, they know it's not like boom shakalan, tomorrow we have a good agile team and they follow everything. So I, I think it's a good idea if we sit together and just share our problems and how hard it is to transform from waterfall to agile. And just yeah. if we have any experience on that, we can share with each other, but not try to just code, okay, in Scrum Guide said this and this. No, just based on real experience that how hard it is. Just feel that we are not alone. We are not the only people that like don't have. There, it's like, uh, not every situation, not every circumstance is right for a case study approach. I think so, yeah. There's other ways to do things, absolutely. Yeah. Back to the so I've had the benefit of doing a lot of the Harvard case studies years ago, um, and you know, and they're all like incredibly well written around a sort of style of presenting the problem. And anyway, it's all about here's, here's a whole bunch of stuff that led up to this particular point, and then it stops, and that's the you then get into the mode of, well, what do you all think? What should we do now? Yeah. And then it all you go away, you do your breakouts, and then you come back, and it then goes, and this is how it actually played out, yeah. sort of thing. As we were going through the example here, of course, we started with a bit of a, a narrative and we weren't quite sure where the intercept point is. Right. Um, and I kind of like the point of maybe there isn't an end of the story yet. You know, this is, it might, you might have some subject material where it's, I've gotten to this point now and I don't know what the future is and I want to engage with all these people here to yeah. hear your thoughts. Um, it's, it's almost a chance to get some sort of you know, free consulting input from your colleagues sure, in the sure. community, right, Absolutely. as well. So that's, that's the same point. Like, yeah. Not every piece of content. Well, let's have a look at the next one, right? So the next, hackers, hey, by the way, I'll come back to that. Um, so yeah, there are different ways to approach it. So there's a discussion, right? So a couple of years ago, I said, prove to me that hiring an agile coach is a good idea. I've got some really compelling evidence that it was. Yeah, I've got some slides here that says, what does a good conversation look like? You know, there's the design thinking double diamond. It's like, you know, as a facilitator, you'll open up the conversation, generate a lot of ideas, and as a facilitator, you'll eventually close it down so that people feel like they got to an end it didn't just end in you know, a kind of a blurry mess, right? So if you run a discussion type approach, you just need to be a good facilitator. But you don't necessarily have to have a clear outcome in mind, you just have to be able to guide the conversation to get to an end point. What other methods would you use <laughs> apart from the ones that's there, right? So you can do panels, you can do interviews, you can do sit in a circle and talk to each other. I should have put, should have put retrospective as a form. Anyone else? Visuals map. Visual map. Visual mapping or visual collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Visual collaboration. Fantastic. Okay. Live drawing. Sorry? Live drawing. Life drawing. Live drawing. Live drawing. Live drawing. Oh, drawing. Like stuff. Yep. Oh, that's it. Sorry. I didn't, sorry. I, I'm yeah. definitely one ear, so I don't. So give me a wave. <laughs> yeah, so sketch noting or live drawing a conversation. Yeah. yeah you can ideas? prepare up front a few slides and you can kind of. Uh, Hide and unhide, and you can, you know, yeah, draw a few things that have some things pre prepared. So, and, and you, can take, you can take a half an hour or 40 minutes, but you could walk in with like three slides to kind of set the scene, right? Yeah, so and then you know, you put some information down, which is the platform for a conversation, and then you let people run with it. So, there's lots of different ways you can run a conversation. I think the important thing is turn up with a structure, right? So um, so, some anti patterns in like open conversation types is like when somebody turns up and they already know the answer. Right? Have you ever been in one of those conversations? Right? You know what they're doing. Right? They're just railroading their point of view into everyone else's head, and that doesn't work. That's shitty. That's bullying. That's being an asshole. But be generally curious. Facilitate, but you know you're there to facilitate because you're seeking an answer. You're not there to tell everyone. So you know, really hold back on your own opinion and just like watch the room and make sure that everyone's contribution is heard. Um, you guys are smart good facilitators generally so you know how to elicit the quiet people to into the conversation and you know how to shut down the light, loud people but just like be cognizant that that needs to be done so have a structure right guide the conversation but also the most probably one of the more important things is like watch the time and get to an end yeah right because people hate it where the bell rings and you have to just stop right they want to get to closure right um
uh, games. So a couple of weeks ago here we ran lean, lean, lean something or other. Get Kanban? Well, that was the, no, not no. Get Kanban. But there's the lean Get startup Kanban game. Board. Yeah, lean something like that. Lean, lean startup game. Lean startup game. Lean. I can't remember. It's a board yeah. game. There's Lego games. There's card games. There's lots of different games, right? Like why games are good is they create a constrained environment. Like there's rules, right? And there's like objects, like board games or cards or whatever, right? So so it's not it's not going to go just anywhere. It's a constrained environment, and people are thinking about the systems and the interactions and the consequences. But one of the most powerful things about games is it gets people to ideally collaborate. There's competition games like Monopoly, but there's also lots of collaboration games. And a lot of the training games in the Agile and Lean space are collaboration games. And so they encourage people to exchange information, work with each other, and solve things together. Um, and they're also the, they're a limited version of simulations. So they're a really powerful tool. Um, and on top of that, like during the course of a day, when you run games, those of you that have been in the training game, you, a training game, you know, at the end of it, you run this exercise that you've run like 50 times, and you go, so what have you learned from that? And every single time you do it, somebody says something you never expected, right? So they're open learning activities as well. They're not directed. You're not giving them, this is the goal, hit the target. You're going, run this activity, and based on the knowledge and experience that you've brought to the table today, what did you learn, right? And then people's experience would generate something new. So that, that chart there just gives you an example. Like the purple one is like the amount of learning that happens when you've got games going on. Right, so yeah, and the other things are like more kind of fuzzy things. So an example of a game, really simple game. Uh, well, there are so many. Um, but no, this isn't Kanban games. Mm -hmm. Five minutes. Yeah, the Kanban game. Yeah. yeah, so an example of that is, um, you know, this paper playing game, the Olympic Carpaccio game, the marshmallow game. Do you guys know them? Yeah. Right? There's the, uh, I'm just gonna skip to the next page. Um, Everything's got weird. All right. So I was going to give an example of that one where you write your name down, but I won't do it. Instead, I just also highlight this picture. When you do um, design games, think about this, right? What's the skill level required? What's the skill level that's going to be present? What's the challenge level in the game? And try to land in that zone because that thing gives you a good loading outcome. If you're sitting over here, people are just like frustrated or annoyed or stressed or whatever, and they're not really learning. So you've got to put them in a place where they're challenged but not stressed. So be thinking about that as well, right? So match it to the audience. Now, if you know who the audience is, that's great. Design a game, right? For instance, Susan, you've been in this industry for a long time. You know, so people turn up for conferences. You can nail design a game for a conference really easily. You know exactly what to do. Any of you other guys trainers in the room? So you'd have good experience with it. You'd know what to do. Um, if you've never done a game before, I'd say go to the conference a couple of times first. Get a vibe for the level of the audience, and then you can do it, right? Like if you want to go to a conference and you want to run a game and you've never done it before, but you really do want to do it, go to Tasty Cupcakes. There's a whole list of industry-related games that trainers and coaches and stuff reach into and grab. Just browse through, pick one. You actually practice it with your team at work, get it done so you know how to facilitate it, and then just come. Like games are good, right? When you submit content to this conference, if you say it's a game, you're guaranteed to get a slot because usually two people submit a game. Right, but I want like 10 or 12 or something like that. So what does a good session look like? Not too many slides. Um, ask yourself these questions. So I'm giving you a checklist here, right? <laughs> if you're going to do the work. But make your own. Think about what quality looks like. Think about what a good outcome looks like. And then check yourself, check your presentation, check the submission against the criteria. Right? Ultimately, the most important thing is we're delivering value to other people. 